thanks for having me today. Um, thanks very much for that fantastic introduction. Wolves, that's why we're here today. We're going to be talking about wolves. Um, as I was well introduced already, I'm a wildlife biologist. In fact, I'm the wolf biologist for all of Central Oregon. Uh, I have wolves under my jurisdiction from the Blue Mountains all the way to the Cascades. And when wolves occasionally show up on the west side of the Cascades, I deal with those as well. So it's a big area. Um, and I'm excited to be here and talk to you today about what I know about wolves. Fortunately, we all know a lot about wolves because they are one of the most well understood species on the planet. There's a lot to learn still, but they've been researched a lot over the last several decades. So I've got big shoulders to stand upon. Um, Today's agenda, we're going to be talking about wolf ecology. I like to talk about their biology, their evolutionary history. I think that all of that helps us to understand and appreciate the species that we're talking about. Um, fortunately, wolves have a tremendous reputation. Unfortunately, a lot of that reputation is based in myth or a misunderstanding of the species. Um, so we're going to kind of crack this nut and talk a little bit more about what the animal actually is. That's my goal today. It's to help you understand what a wolf is, a very realistic scientific approach to this species. Um, we're also going to be talking a little bit about the human history of wolves and wolf coexistence because we're humans, we're animals on this planet, and we have a shared history with wolves. So we'll talk a little bit about their recovery, specifically in the American West, and of course a little bit about our own backyard here in Oregon. I'm very informal, so I don't mind interruptions. I don't mind if you have something that you'd like me to clarify or to expound on. So please interrupt if we hit on a, a subject that piques your interest, by all means, Let's talk about it. I'm here for you, not for my slideshow, not for my agenda. Um, in fact, if we don't make it all the way through my slide presentation, that's OK. It's just pictures. Um, again, my objective is to hopefully help you have a better understanding of wolves today. Uh, we will have a Q&A at the end of our presentation, though. So if you're shy or if you can't think of a question in the moment uh, and it comes to you maybe five or ten minutes later, store it away, and, and we'll get to it. So without further ado, I will begin uh, by again introducing myself. So uh, I'm a wolf biologist. I'm employed by the Oregon Department of Fish and Wildlife. Um, in case you're not familiar with how wildlife is managed in the United States, I think this is important to realize that through the Tenth Amendment, um, all states are responsible for managing wildlife. So it's not the federal government that manages wildlife, it's the states. Um, therefore, every single state in the country has a state wildlife agency. But to make everyone really confused, every state seems to have picked a different name for their agency. So you have Oregon Department of Fish and Wildlife, Utah Division of Wildlife Resources, Montana Fish, Wildlife, and Parks. The point is, is that we all are managing wildlife at a state level. Now, there's a couple of exceptions to this. Uh, in the early 1900s, we created uh, a bird treaty act because we recognized that birds migrate. And so we started to protect birds at a federal level because not only do states manage birds, but they go from state to state. Therefore, a lot of states are involved. Therefore, the federal government gets involved. And then in the 1960s and 70s, um, we created the Endangered Species Act, and species that are imperiled get listed on this list under this act, and the federal government comes in to help the species recover with the states. The states participate in the recovery process, and the goal is, of course, to help species not be imperiled. And once they're no longer considered imperiled, then the management goes back to the states. Um, I've had a career working with a lot of different agencies. Um, I've noted some of the groups here 
on my presentation because I think it's important to acknowledge uh, their collaboration with my research in particular. So I've, uh, I'm a research associate with the Northern Rockies Conservation Cooperative based out of Jackson Hole, Wyoming. Um, I've worked with the USDA. Uh, I spent five years working with Yellowstone National Park's Wolf Project where I did my master's degree and then, as was mentioned, became the project lead of an interior study in the park. Um, I grew up out of, outside of Yellowstone. My family's been outside of Yellowstone for six generations. So this last week was our 176th year um, being in the area. And therefore, I've got a really deep sentimental attachment to the American West. Uh, it's been my home and my family's home for a long time, and we've been here longer than the national parks. Anyone know when Yellowstone was first created as the world's first national park? 1863. Not 63. I thought I heard someone say it, though. 71? Close. 72. 1872. Um, March 1st. That's probably where the one came into play. Um, but yeah, I think that uh, all of this really kind of helps me to better understand my role as a biologist and how as much as we care about the species and the facts, we're still humans ultimately. And I think what makes humanity unique is our interest in stories. And I'll talk more about that in a minute. Um, but yeah, I have I think a pretty interesting story growing up outside of the Rocky Mountains. I remember when wolves were first reintroduced. My family is pretty divided on wolves. I've got wolf haters and wolf killers in my family, whom I love, and I've got wolf, you know, advocates, if you will, in my family, and I'm the biologist that sits at the table, and Sunday dinners are always interesting. <laughs> um, I'm currently a doctoral student at Utah State University, as was mentioned, and I'm studying wolves not just in Oregon, but across the American West, trying to um, figure out ways for us to best coexist. But, I've had the opportunity to work with a lot of different species, including uh, trapping and, and collaring grizzly bears outside of Yellowstone, black bears, bighorn sheep, mountain lions, bison, etc. Now, the meat of our presentation today. Wolves. Um, right when you say wolf, right when you say wolves, immediately imagery pops into your head. There's a lot of interesting, heavy laden, cognition that comes with the term wolf. And when I bring up the species wolf, when I bring up the symbol wolf, uh, I get usually one of two reactions. People are very interested in wolves, they like wolves, or they don't like them, they hate them. Um, there's not a lot of apathy. People have an opinion one way or the other, which I find very interesting because unfortunately wolves have been caught in the crosshairs of a very controversial battle for a long time. This is not just an American Western story. We're in the American West. My expertise is in the American West. But wolves and humans evolved together, and we've had conflict with wolves for thousands of years. And I think that this is something that makes the wolf even more interesting, because we have such common history with this species. This is a quote from one of my friend and mentors, Dr. Susan Clark, out of her book, Large Carnivore Coexistence, that I think is very applicable. Despite being biological entities, large carnivores are almost entirely represented as symbols and emotions. There are very few people in this world who will ever encounter a wolf in the wild. And yet, we have strong opinions of wolves, again, one way or another. You might live in an area where you don't have wolves. Perhaps you live in an area where you've never had wolves. And yet, still bringing up the species tends to ignite some kind of mental symbolism. To some people, wolves are noble, heroic. They are denizens of the wilderness. They they embody something that is truly magnificent, maybe a little bit magical. And to others, they are a threat. They are insecurity. They are dangerous. They are problematic. Again, one way or another, 
people have opinions about wolves. And they don't necessarily have to have ever encountered a wolf to have come up with their own conclusions. Um, while at Yellowstone National Park, my supervisor, Doug Smith, who ran the Yellowstone Wolf Project for 26 years, he often would say, we can't educate people about wolves. We just have discussions with them because they've already got their minds made up. And I think that that's, that's pretty accurate. I deal with a lot of people, a lot of different backgrounds, a lot of different opinions on a daily basis. And uh, at the end of the day, the best I can do is have discussions with folks about wolves. Now, let's peel back some of our misconceptions about wolves. And misconceptions, I'll warn you right now, might not just be anti-wolf misconceptions. There might be pro-wolf misconceptions as well. And as a biologist, as a scientist, my goal again is to help us understand what the real animal actually is and what it isn't. Isn't this a phenomenal illustration? Wow, look at that guy. He doesn't have a prayer. Um, <laughs> So let's dive in and start to dissect what the facts and the myths actually are and are not. So to begin, I always like to take a step backward and look at things through an evolutionary perspective. So I invite you to join me for just a minute, and my hope is to not get too technical. I don't want to bore you. Um, I also don't want to lose you. Um, but again, I think that it's important for us to understand what we call the phylogenetics of this species history. The phylogenetics meaning the evolutionary relationship that wolves have with other animals on the landscape. So wolves are a part of an order in the animal kingdom known as the carnivores, the carnivora. And carnivora literally translates to flesh eaters, meat eaters, which shouldn't surprise anyone, right? We know that wolves eat meat. And there are two main branches in the evolutionary tree of the order carnivora. We have the feliforms, or the cat family. The cat family evolved or originated in Eurasia. That's where all of their roots take place. And the cat family includes, of course, the cats, but it also includes the civets and the mongooses and the hyenas. And then we have the other branch of this tree, the caniforms, which of course includes the dogs, the bears, as well as the seals, the raccoons, the weasels, etc. So these are the two main branches of our family tree. And the caniforms had their origin story take place in the New World. So cats and dogs from the very beginning don't get along. They're from opposite sides of the spectrum, you could say. Um, something that makes the, the physical characteristics of the caniform group unique include, oh, there's your dogs right there, this auditory bully at the back of the skull, which cats have as well, but there's an ossification of some of the ear bones. So these, this space at the back of the skull helps species to hear in distinct ways. And there are, there's a divergence in the evolutionary process of how these bones fuse together or didn't fuse together based on which group of animal you're in, whether you're a dog-like animal or a cat-like animal. Also, something else that a lot of the caniforms have is this specialized shelf on their carnassial. So the carnassial are these premolars and molars at the back of your dog or your cat's mouth, right? Most of us are pretty, pretty familiar with at least our cats and our dogs. And their molars and premolars back here at the back of their mouth are unique. They don't look like ours, right? They're sharp. They're scissor-like. Cats and the, or the feliforms have distinctly scissor-like carnassials, which makes them more obligated to consume meat. They are dedicated to meat. They specialize in eating meat. And for that reason, they are, I would argue, true predators. They are specialized in hunting and killing, and they eat meat in order to survive. The caniforms have this specialized shelf, which we call a talonid, which gives them the ability to masticate and grind their food, not just slice through their food. 
Bears are an even better example than our dogs. Bears, as we all know, are omnivores, at least the majority of them, with the exception of our polar bear, right? They're omnivores, and they have molars that are similar to ours, as well as carnassials. This gives them a very generalized diet, so they can eat just about anything. A really great adaptation, evolutionarily speaking, because if you're a specialist, you depend on one food source, and if you can't get it, then you're out of luck, right? But if you can eat a whole variety of things off of the menu, it's going to benefit you in the long run. So dogs also have this talonid. They have this shelf. And it's true that they are almost completely obligatory carnivores. They eat meat almost exclusively. They still can masticate and chew through hard things like bones, and in some cases they can eat um, what we call roughage, plants, and they can also even consume berries. So they have more of a more flexibility in their diet than cats do. Everyone with me so far? And then, of course, we have this elongated rostrum or snout. This area of the face, which is elongated through evolution, provides two tremendous advantages to the dog family. They can better thermal regulate when they're on the move, which I'll talk more about this in just a minute, because this is the superpower of the wolf, their ability to move. And because they have these long noses, they can breathe in and cool their body more efficiently when they're on the move than other species. And they also have billions of olfactory receptors, which make them phenomenal at smelling things really, really good at smelling things, which shouldn't be a surprise to anyone here. Dogs have great noses, right? Wolves have tremendous noses. Bears have probably even better noses. Um, but this ability to see the world through your nose is something that we cannot conceive of. I, I talk to people about this all the time. So I live trap wolves to radio collar them. And wolves can smell anything that I mess up. If I handle a trap with my bare hands and then I bury it, the wolf knows it's there. And this is hard for us to conceive of, again, because we primarily see the world through our eyes. But for an animal like the wolf, it doesn't see things first and foremost through the eyes. It sees things through its nose. Again, at a level that we cannot comprehend. So the world looks different to them. And I think that that's pretty cool. Now, as I already mentioned, going way back, the earliest forms of the feliform, or the caniforms, sorry, your dog-like animals, they originated in uh, the New World in North America during the Miocene. But eventually, through evolution and lots of species coming and going, we ultimately had the progenitor to the wolf, which crossed the Bering Land Bridge during the Pleistocene, and made its way over into Eurasia. So the Bering Land Bridge is this enormous spatial connectivity between the New World, Alaska, and Eurasia. And we should be familiar with this because there's a lot of biotic interchange that took place during the two million years of the Pleistocene, or the Ice Age, where animals were coming back and forth, going back and forth. Brown bears came over to North America. Wild horses went over to Eurasia after evolving here. Humans ultimately came over here through the Bering Land Bridge. Um, but on this Bering Land Bridge, again, the progenitor to the wolf, a hundred, excuse me, hundreds of thousands of years ago, between 300,000 and 800,000 years ago, uh, the progenitor to the wolf crossed uh, over from the Bering Land Bridge into Eurasia, where it evolved into the modern wolf about 130,000 to 300,000 years ago is our best documentation to date. So the modern wolf, Canis lupus, as we recognize it, really originated in Eurasia, even though the Canis genus started here in North America. And again, through biotic interchange, wolves crossed from the Bering Land Bridge over here into North America. Everyone with me so far? Now, the cousin of the wolf, the coyote, it exclusively evolved here in North America. So there is a big, big gap 
and the genetic relatedness between coyotes and wolves. Coyotes on average are about 30 pounds, wolves are on average 100 pounds. And it's more complicated than this, and my genetics professor would wince as I'm about to share this with you, but I think it's, it's okay to say in a generalized way that wolves and coyotes have about a 96% genetic overlap, which is about the same as a human and an orangutan. So that kind of puts things into perspective, okay? But coyotes, aside from domestic dogs, are the closest relative to wolves today, okay? So coyotes exclusively here in the New World, wolves in the Old World, coming back here into the New World. And during the glacier maximums, as glaciers advanced and retreated, we had several successive waves or invasions of wolves as they came here and migrated into North America. Um, and I'm going to kind of avoid getting into this because I don't want to get too complex, but we had at least three major invasions, is what biologists call them, of wolves coming from the Old World into North America. And all of this is again between 10,000 years ago and 130,000 years ago. Now, wolves, as I have already mentioned, can move. And this is very important because wolves evolved in the Old World. They came into the New World in several successive waves. And because wolves have a generalist diet, because they're so good at moving on the landscape, there is almost no speciation, is what we call it. Wolves are wolves just about everywhere. A wolf is a wolf is a wolf. Canis lupus is what its scientific name is. And it doesn't really make any sense for us to start splitting and saying that this wolf is a different species than that wolf. The reason why this is important for me to bring up is because every day I hear, we reintroduced the wrong damn wolf. It's those damned Canada Greys that we brought in. It wouldn't be so bad if we had the right species, but it's the wrong species of wolf that we have. I hear this a lot. This is a big misconception. Again, wolves being so dynamic, being able to move across huge geographic areas, are able to basically breed with any potential population on the landscape. They're a lot like humans in that way. And so we don't have distinct genetic populations that are isolated. Only at the most distal ends of their region do we have any kind of variation. So those beautiful white wolves that you see on your nature specials that are clear up in Ellesmere Island and up in the Arctic, those are still Canis lupus. Those are gray wolves. It's just a subspecies, or I would argue an ecotype, a variant that has evolved to meet its own local adaptations. But those are genetic modifications, not genetic divergence, right? So it's the same animal. Likewise, if you move further and further south and you get to Canis lupus bailei, the Mexican gray wolf, it's still Canis lupus. It's still the gray wolf, although its body size is smaller and it's more adapted to its desert environment, right? Um, here, throughout Alaska and down through the northern Rocky Mountain Cordillera and into Oregon, we have wolves that are large. Um, again, on average, 100 pounds, and this is historically what we've always had in this area. And again, it's based off of its adaptations to its own environment. But all of these wolves can, can crossbreed, they can all mix together because it's all one genetic pool. Got it? Any questions? Okay, let's get out of the, the evolutionary phase. All right? Now we're moving into more of the human history of wolves for just a minute. What I think is incredibly fascinating is that the wolf was the first animal ever domesticated. It was the first thing ever domesticated. We domesticated the wolf before we domesticated plants or any other animal. And it took place as early as 16,000 years ago, all the way back to perhaps even 32,000 years ago. To put that into perspective, the next animals that we domesticated your cows and your sheep and your horses, that took place between eight and 10,000 years ago. So we had domestic dogs for a very long time before we got anything else. And for you cat fans out there, we domesticated cats nine to 10,000 years ago. So the dog is truly man's best friend. Um, but this is a really interesting process that took place in Eurasia. 
We don't exactly know how this took place, um, but it's important to realize that dogs in all of their wide varieties are essentially wolves. They share 99.9% .9 of the same DNA as a wolf. Again, this comes down to genetic modification rather than genetic divergence. So we have natural selection, which is generally nature selecting for certain specific characteristics during the evolutionary process. And then we have artificial selection, right? Where people select for certain attributes that are gonna be appealing or most beneficial to themselves. And in the case of domestication of the wolf, people over tens of thousands of years have artificially selected certain traits or behavioral characteristics out of populations in order to get the wide variety of dog breeds that we have today. It's also important to realize that the majority of our dog breeds today really took off in the late Victorian era. So if you were to go back 300 years ago, 200 years ago, you'd have a lot less variety in the physiognomy, the different physical characteristics of our dog breeds, right? But if you have a dog, you know a lot about wolf biology already, with some major differences, of course. Um, dogs have what's called a neotenous retention of behavior. So they act more puppy-like, even when they're adults, which is how we wanted them. We want them to be dependent on humans. We want to be their masters. Wolves, however, are always looking for an opportunity to become the leader. They are always trying to become independent, right? I'll get more into this in, the, in just a minute when we talk about the social dynamics of wolves, but it's important to realize that every wolf has the potential to become what is commonly referred to as an alpha, right? So that's why wolf dogs are bad pets, because you can never really trust them, because they're gonna be submissive to you perhaps one day, but the next day, perhaps not. Even um, females? Even females, yep. So again, I think this is really fascinating because man's best friend is also man's worst enemy. Um, we have this very long, complicated relationship with dogs and it's all based off of perhaps several domestication events that took place again in Eurasia um, we call it the communal pathway to domestication. Wolves, or rather a subspecies of the modern wolf that we have today, probably followed human camps around and lived off of our refuse and became habituated to people before ultimately we started to domesticate them. Um, eventually though, people came here into North America and they brought with them their domestic companions. So humans began to cross the Bering Land Bridge between 100 to 20,000 years ago, our current best estimates. But again, wolves have been here for a long time, as early as 130,000 years ago, having crossed over the Bering Land Bridge. And I don't want to get too technical with this, but I do think it's rather interesting. As people crossed the Bering Land Bridge with their dogs, which looked very much like wolves, um, the wolf and dog population crossbred. There was introgression. And because of this introgression between prehistoric dogs and wolves, we had introduced into our American wolf population a genome which creates the phenotypic characteristic of black fur. So in our wolf population, especially here in the northern Rockies, we have a mix of black wolves and gray wolves. And all of this took place between 10,000 years ago to 7,000 years ago. So there's an advantage to being a black wolf. If you're a black wolf, you tend to have more immunity towards diseases like canine distemper, which is great. Um, pup survival rates increase if you're black. But if you're gray, if you have the gray coat colorization, you tend to live longer because you have higher cortisol levels, and you tend to be more aggressive, and you fight for your survival a little bit more aggressively than black wolves do. But of course we have you know, opposites attracting, major histocompatibility complex is the overly complicated way of saying this, but wolves that are black very often mate with wolves that are gray. So out on the landscape today, you can see gray wolves and you can see black wolves.
which I think is pretty remarkable. We were able to research this and come up with the conclusions of this through a lot of work in Yellowstone National Park, where we have a very unique opportunity to look at the blood serum and the DNA of wolves collected ever since wolves were reintroduced in the mid-90s. So it's a pretty cool, pretty cool success story of discovery. Now, everyone with me so far? Okay, so we've got wolves, right? Wolves evolved. They're members of the order Carnivora. They evolved in Eurasia. Eventually, they crossed over here into North America. People started domesticating wolves tens of thousands of years ago, and then people started showing up in North America with their domesticated wolves. Now, it's important for us to realize that wolves, because of their ability to move on the landscape, have perhaps the greatest terrestrial distribution of any animal on the planet except humans, at least historically. That means that basically everywhere in the northern hemisphere at one point in time you could find wolves. Wolves were found in the British Isles, they were found in uh, Siberia of course, they were found in Scandinavia, they were found in northern Africa through, um, the Arab through Saudi Arabia, through um, through India, and then of course through North America, all the way down through central and southern Mexico. So wolves have this tremendous distribution across the landscape. And so it's no wonder that people, for tens of thousands of years, have been coexisting with this animal, and we have such a powerful sentiment about this species. Because whether you were an indigenous Native American, or whether you grew up in India, or you grew up in Scandinavia, you most likely encountered wolves and you most likely therefore have strong cultural sentiments regarding the wolf. So of course we've got um, totemic carvings of wolves here in North America, we've got the familiar um, Allfather Odin in Scandinavia with his wolves in Norse mythology, we have the famous story of Mowgli uh, penned by <coughs> Rudyard Kipling who was raised by wolves, we have Remus and Romulus who were suckled by a she-wolf, the founders of Rome, We've got temples to wolves um, dedicated in Japan, and of course we've got our fairy tales, right? With Little Red Riding Hood and the Little Pigs, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So wolves are without a doubt one of the most controversial species on the planet. And when people ask me why, I think it's a no-brainer. Because so many people, at least in the Northern Hemisphere, have coexisted with wolves for a very long time. And wolves are an apex predator and they are dangerous, and they sometimes threaten our livelihoods, especially when we adopt agrarian practices. And so it's no wonder that we have this really complicated relationship with this species. Again, that's been going on for thousands of years. People haven't always liked wolves, and it's, again, not fair to say that this is an American Western story. Because people have had a hard time living with wolves, they have been systematically eradicated through much of their historic range. In fact, the earliest documented wolf bounty that we know of took place in ancient Greece in the 6th century BC, where you could get paid for killing wolves in order to reduce depredation on livestock. Even here in North America, there are documentation of indigenous Native Americans systematically wiping out small populations of wolves in order to boost the moose and deer populations. It's complicated, but if we look in our past history about how we were living on the landscape, it's no wonder. They are remarkable. Obviously, we're fascinated with them. That's why we domesticated them in the first place. In the first place, excuse me. But also, it can be complicated. In some, in some cases, they can be threatening to us. Um, because of their predatory nature and because of their adaptability on the landscape. Even today, this is a current rock and roll band that I'm listening to, we still have symbolism with wolves. Um, you can't get away from it. There's something pretty distinctly unique about the wolf and it's tough and it's, it's mean and it's in some cases friendly and it's, it's noble. So this symbolism of the wolf persists and even is a is, even is taken advantage of by myself today. So now let's talk a little bit about the biology of the wolf and what this species actually is. And this I think is fascinating because a lot of what we have learned has been learned in the last 50 years or so. 
Uh, the whole study of ecology is a relatively new science, um, and our understanding of it is very rudimentary. In fact, the term ecology was coined in the 1930s, so it just goes to show that it's, it's not something that we have appreciated or understood for very long. And let's take that into consideration when we move further into the human coexistence with wolves, especially here in the American West. But most of what we do know about wolves, again, has been discovered in the last 50 years or so, really in the last 25 years. So Canis lupus is the species. Gray wolf is the common name, but obviously we've established that not all gray wolves are gray. There are black wolves and there are white wolves. Some gray wolves look more rusty than not. Um, this pair up here, this is a, a pack that I studied in Yellowstone for a long time. But you can see that they kind of have some reddish rusty tint to them as well as that lighter colored male on the left hand side. Um, wolves have a lifespan that averages about two to five years, which I think surprises people. They live and die very quick because they live hard lives. They can live up to 12 years, just like a big dog can, um, but rarely does that take place in the wild. And the reason why is because if humans aren't killing wolves, then wolves are killing wolves. And if wolves aren't killing wolves, then what they're chasing to hunt and kill, kills them. And then you have disease outbreaks, and you have accidents, etc. So wolves generally don't live more than five years. Um, very quick burst of flame in terms of uh, a life history. The average size of a wolf here in the West is about 100 pounds. Males are larger than females. Um, the sexual dimorphism is pretty common in most mammals. So males are about 20% larger than females. Um, 110 pounds is a big male, but they can get up to 120 pounds. Uh, it's important to realize that wolves live feast and famine style, so they can go weeks without eating, and then when they do eat, they can eat up to 20 pounds of meat in one sitting. So sometimes when you catch a wolf and you weigh a wolf, you have to take into consideration, is its belly full or not? Um, females, again, a bit smaller, so on average about 90 pounds. So that kind of, again, puts things into perspective, and people often think of them as much larger than they are, and that's usually because of their big furry coats in the wintertime, um, you can see pictures of people who hunt them. People who hunt them usually hunt them in the winter when the coats are biggest and heaviest. But wolves also have a disproportionately long legs and big feet, even for wolves. So their tracks are huge and their legs are long. Now, it doesn't matter what level of wolf background you have, ask anyone and they probably know that wolves live in groups called packs. But what most people don't realize is that wolf packs are not mobs or gangs, they are simply family units. They are a nuclear family unit, um, very similar to humans. In fact, this is something that we often take for granted because we share this in common with wolves. Wolves are what are known as a um, cooperative breeding species. So you have biparental care, meaning the mom and dad help the kids grow up, but you also have alloparental care, which means that other adults, not the mom and dad, will help the pups grow up. Oftentimes this is older siblings, so a generation born perhaps the year before. Um, again, this is pretty unique and we're beginning to understand it a little bit more now as we've been studying wolves, especially in Yellowstone for the last 25 years. For a long time, we would refer to uh, dominant breeding wolves, the male and the female, as alphas. You probably have all heard that, an alpha male and alpha female. But in the scientific community, we try and avoid the term alpha because that is a descriptor of personality. And not all breeders, not all moms and dads are alphas. Um, Again, I mentioned this earlier, but all wolves have the potential to become a breeder, and that's just like in our human families, kind of the goal. You raise your kids to go off to college, and you hope that they can meet a boyfriend or girlfriend out there and raise a family of their own. And that's what's taking place. So wolves generally will um, 
raise their offspring, and then when wolves reach sexual maturity, which is about two years old, they'll split and they'll leave the family and they'll go off on their own to try and find a mate. And sometimes they're successful, and more often than not, they're not successful. And that comes back to uh, what we call intraspecific competition. Wolves are very aggressive towards other wolves. They're very territorial. On average, wolves give birth to six pups in the spring. They reproduce just once a year. Dogs you might be familiar with have two estrus cycles, but wolves only go through one estrus cycle. At this latitude, they breed around Valentine's Day. And then they whelp, or they have their pups, generally around tax day, which helps us remember just where they're at in terms of reproduction. Again, on average, about six pups are born, but only about half of those will survive their first year. So usually about three survive, and that's just because nature's tough. Um, in fact, this pup survival number that I have here, four to five years, is in Yellowstone. So that's Yellowstone's. You always have to take with a grain of salt Yellowstone's facts because Yellowstone is kind of a, a unique uh, landscape, right? In fact, I often tease my old supervisor, Doug Smith, that Yellowstone is not a natural landscape because there aren't humans coexisting with wolves. And everywhere else on Earth, humans are coexisting with wolves. Um, again, wolves are highly territorial, which also makes them pretty unique. Um, we often will say that a species is territorial. We'll talk about grizzly bears having a territory or moose or elk having a territory, and that's actually not accurate. Um, bears and moose and elk have home ranges and they can tolerate overlapping spaces with one another. But wolves are distinctly territorial and they fight to the death to defend their territories. So a family unit will work very hard to protect the resources in their unit. And when other wolves move in, it's usually a fight to the death, which means that when a wolf grows up and is ready to go off and find a mate of its own, and it's dispersing across the landscape, it's very risky business, because they might walk into a neighborhood that is not so friendly, and they can get beat up and killed, as was the case with this wolf that I, um, fold, I uh, pulled out of the back country. Um, we did a necropsy on it, and this pup of the year, he was, let's see, he was 15 months old, so he was just getting ready to disperse. He walked into the wrong neighborhood and he got beat up pretty good, as you can see. Um, family units, I think the social aspect of wolf behavior and ecology is perhaps one of the most fascinating things about the species. Um, wolves don't necessarily have to live in nuclear families, but that kind of makes it easy for us to understand their social dynamics. But in some cases, you have stepmoms and stepdads that move in because a breeder dies. In some cases, you have grandmas and grandpas that are living with a pack. Sometimes you have uncles and aunts that haven't moved out. And in some cases, you have uh, adoptees, where again, a wolf might disperse and come across another pack. And rather than getting beat up and killed, they just adopt that wolf into the pack. Uh, but generally, wolves avoid inbreeding, as most animals do. Um, the only cases where we really document inbreeding is where the population has been really suppressed. So if you're familiar with Isle Royale and their wolf population, it's an island, right? And uh, wolves crossed uh, an ice bridge back in the 40s, and ultimately the, that population bottlenecked because, again, it's an island. Um, that's a different story that we can talk about later, though. So to some degree, because wolves uh, conflict with one another and they, they kill each other, you might argue that they self-regulate to some degree. Which as a biologist makes it really convenient for me to go out and study wolves because as soon as I find one, I can usually find the pack and then I kind of can figure out where their territory is and I very quickly will realize if there are other wolves in the area because wolves find wolves and when they do, they fight. Does that make sense? Okay, no questions so far, huh? So they, they generally do not cannibalize. So they usually just kill each other. And this one obviously had Yes, that was by birds, though. Oh. So by the time that I took this picture, it had been eaten by other things. Yeah. But they do not generally practice cannibalism. And wolves, we already mentioned this a minute ago, they're the 
older brother. They're the cousin of the coyote. Wolves hate coyotes. Wolves will very often kill coyotes, but not consume them. Um, yeah. That's a really good question. So let me scoot back for just a second. So remember how I talked that we have had several invasions of wolves during the Pleistocene coming from Eurasia? Well, when wolf populations are suppressed or persecuted by people, then on rare occasions we have wolf populations looking for breeding opportunities and they often will cross with coyotes and they'll hybridize. Now, I have to be careful with this because this again only happens in populations that have been suppressed. So we document this in the eastern portion of the United States. Um, and we'll get, this will be more clear in a minute when I talk about the history of humans and wolves in North America specifically. But when we began eradicating wolves throughout all of the US, small populations remained viable in the forests of the boundary waters around the Great Lakes states. And those wolves crossed over with coyotes. Now this is really interesting and it's also confusing because all members of the Canis genus can hybridize. They can cross over. Okay? They're all capable of, of breeding with one another. Even though there's a pretty big genetic difference between coyotes and wolves, they can still produce viable offspring. But again, this doesn't happen very often. In the eastern wolf populations, we've documented as much as 40% of coyote genome in those wolves. But here in the Rockies and through Alaska, we have never documented any coyote genes in the wolf population. More often than not, they kill each other. In fact, during one research project, um, a captive wolf bred with a captive coyote and the captive wolf whelped and then she killed all of her pups. So they do not like each other. And needless to say, our population out here, which is robust, there's not a lot of genetic suppression, there is no reason for a wolf to ever consider breeding with a coyote. They can find something else. And the same thing goes with dogs, for that matter, too. So here we don't have any detection of hybridization with dogs. <coughs> Again, dogs are more closely related to wolves than coyotes and wolves are. But we haven't documented that throughout this portion of North America. In Europe, we have documented that. Um, and I think it's Spain, they have like 15% domestic dog bred into their wolf population. But separating dog genomes and, and wolf genomes are really difficult because, again, they have so much, um, so much alike, right? Really, it comes down to an enzyme, a digestive enzyme that helps us figure it out. They are, yes. So they do not. Yep. Coyotes evolved here in, in the Americas, in North America specifically, now through Central America. Um, but we don't have coyotes over there in Eurasia. We do have jackals, which are kind of the counterpart. Good questions, you guys. All right. So now that we have a little bit of a better understanding of their social dynamics, we've got a mom and a dad, generally speaking. Um, the pups kind of hold the pack together. Everything is, again, this cooperative breeding unit. Um, I think it's important for us to come back to the obvious, which is wolves are carnivores, right? Wolves eat meat. That's how they survive. If wolves ate daisies, we wouldn't be here today. We wouldn't be having this conversation about why wolves are controversial. Um, but they eat meat. Um, they're not the most aggressive and successful predators on the landscape. In fact, one myth about the wolf is that they're good predators. They're not. They're terrible predators. They stink at it. Um, the success rate of wolves pursuing and killing elk is well below 20%. When you take into consideration only adult elk, it's below 10%. But wolves are tenacious and they are persistent. So if I could argue that they have two superpowers, it would be one, their tenacity. They live a hard life, and yet they keep at it. And two, again, it's their ability to move. Those long legs, those big feet, the ability to breathe and thermoregulate, and to seek out 
food in a generalist sort of way, again, they're not obligatory to a certain diet, gives them the ability to move across the landscape, which is the reason why they have the greatest distribution across the northern hemisphere of any species except humans, which is also the reason why dogs now dominate the earth, right? Dogs are essentially domesticated wolves, and they can live in just about any environment. So wolves move across the landscape. And because they can move, because their populations don't become isolated and you don't have speciation, speciation excuse me, of certain populations, um, they have this incredible ability to adapt to just about any kind of landscape. But this is where our conflicts all come to a head. I already mentioned that humans, for a long time, have had a complex relationship with wolves. Wolves, when they first evolved, we have to remember, were not the apex predators that we think of them today. During the Pleistocene, you had real apex predators, like the short-faced bear, the dire wolf, which is a distant cousin of the wolf. You had saber-toothed tigers and cats of all varieties. You had lions in North America. You had North American cheetahs. All of these animals were the apex predators. And the wolf, you could say, was the mesopredator, or the middle-sized predator. Um, that all changed when those large carnivores died out, and today the wolf is the largest canid that we have on Earth. And we, again, have had a long, complex relationship in coexisting with them, especially wherever humanity has adopted agrarian practices. Um, humans have adopted ranching and agriculture and the raising of livestock for our own security, our own sense of well-being, and our own economy. And when you have a smart and intelligent and adaptive predator like the wolf in your neighborhood, they quickly figure out how to exploit dumb livestock to their advantage, right? And when this comes to a head, we have complication and people start to dislike wolves. I also um, will share this fact too, which is often overlooked. This audience, I'm going on the bold assumption, generally likes wolves, right? You're here because you think wolves are cool. Um, wolves rarely attack people. We kind of all have that understanding. Wolves are not generally dangerous to people. But when we look back in history, I think it's important for us to recognize the validity of wolves as a danger to humans, especially in areas where rabies was prevalent. Um, we take for granted that Louis Pasteur in 1891 created the rabies vaccine. Rabies is a horrific virus. And in many places of Europe, there were strains of rabies that affected canids, including wolves. And what a nightmare to have rabid wolves in your backyard. Not only that, but I think it's important to take into consideration um, fairy tales and how fairy tales often have wolves targeting children. And in very rural agrarian practices hundreds of years ago, who did you put out into the pasture with your livestock? Who were your shepherds? They were usually your kids. They were usually your kids. In fact, there's a great research paper that came out of a study in the 19th century in communities in rural Russia looking at documentation of attacks uh, of wolves on people. And 99% of them were on shepherd children under the age of 14. So when you've got kids out in the woods alone, um, it's not just wolves, but any kind of predator is extremely dangerous, right? I've got kids. Um, I've raised them in grizzly bear country and in wolf country. We don't need to be hysterical, but when you take kids into consideration, you have to be, you have to be more careful, right? They're more vulnerable. So again, wolves and livestock primarily is where everything comes to a head. And because we're talking in Oregon about North American wolves, and specifically wolves here in this part of the world, um, we'll quickly move into some of the human history. Uh, I mentioned that my family moved to the Intermountain Rockies 176 years ago, right? Uh, Euro-American expansion across North America is pretty well understood, and this is not a history course, so I'm gonna skim over a lot of this, but as Euro-Americans uh, migrated into North America, they brought with them their agrarian practices, and they brought with them their Eurasian livestock. They also brought with them a, a tremendous misunderstanding of the natural resources that were available here on the landscape. 
And I have another course that I've actually given to Ollie talking a little bit about wildlife management here in North America. But it's important to realize that um, people very quickly began to capitalize off of, off of um, the megafauna that lived here in North America. And all of that has since changed. It's now illegal to sell any game meat. If you're a hunter, you cannot sell any of the meat that you harvest. Um, but that used to not be the case. And so we had people capitalizing off of bison, and not just bison, but we also had um, millions of elk across the landscape, millions of pronghorn. And during what we refer to as the great slaughter of the 1800s, all of these populations collapsed. And they collapsed again for various reasons. One of them was for market. But another reason, which is often overlooked, is what do buffalo eat? What do elk eat? They eat plants. They eat grass. What does your livestock eat? Grass, plants. So to oversimplify things, um, Eurasians, excuse me, Euro-Americans coming here um, had a perception, a worldview. And this is, you know, my family. I grew up farming and ranching. And this is not necessarily an evil perception. It's just a terrible misconception, right? That there are good creatures and there are bad creatures. And the good creatures are the ones that you can depend on. And it doesn't make sense to have all those elk and all those buffalo out there eating grass when you can't raise them and, and you can't manage them as livestock. So we're gonna clear a place for our livestock to come in. And in just a few short decades, we went from having tens of millions of megafaunal herbivores to having millions of livestock, sheep and cows, throughout all of the American West, right? And when you, yeah. Those are buffalo skulls. Those are what? Buffalo skulls, bison skulls. Yep, those are bison skulls. Sorry, I took for granted. Um, so they were, these are bison that were killed. And we had probably 30 million bison. For a while we thought 60 million, but then we did the math and that doesn't quite add up. So closer to 30 million bison living across North America. And we went down in about three decades to about 100, so pretty aggressive uh, extermination of animals. And these bison skulls were then piled up and ground into fertilizer. So the bones were all, all taken and used as well. Yeah. They are, yeah. Yep, 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 lots of more or less chaos is what it came down to. Not, not regulating anything and the extirpation of species and ecosystems uh, to make way again for livestock. And again, I think that it's really important to realize that the people who were doing this, although I'm sticking this guy up here, people who were doing this weren't evil. They just had a very, very poor understanding of how things were supposed to work. Again, the term ecology, our understanding of ecology, wasn't coined until the 1930s. And really then, we haven't understood the ecosystem until the last 50 years. And even then, it's, it's still really rudimentary. We're learning a lot. Now, it wasn't the predators that were targeted first in most cases, OK? Wolves being highly adaptive, just like mountain lions and grizzly bears, they really don't care what kind of meat you put before them. They're not very picky. And this is where we have everything really come to a head, where the rubber meets the road. You have predation by wolves on bison, but wolves don't care if you take away the bison and put really dumb and easy to catch cows out on the landscape, <laughs> right? So at the end of the 1800s and into the early 1900s, you had taken away all of your herbivores that are native to the landscape, and you'd stuck out a bunch of dumb, easy-to-catch herbivores. And so when we hear about um, livestock depredation in the early 1900s, and the figures are really high, perhaps they are inflated a little bit, but they can't be inflated that much. And the reason why is because you had a lot of predators 
that were happy and fat on the landscape after scavenging millions of dead buffalo, and now you've got millions of cows. And so depredation was very high. And this, I think, is really important for us to define. The wolf doesn't recognize the difference between these two words, but we do as a society, right? Predation is when a wolf kills prey and eats it. Depredation occurs when property has been damaged. Pirates come in and they depredate on your village, right? Property damage is depredation. And it doesn't just have to be meat. I grew up farming and we'd have problems with bears and with um, deer that would come in and depredate our crops, right? So depredation is what we call when property has been damaged. And depredation is not something that society is okay with. And I think that's understandable to a degree. Even if you really like wolves, if they start to really depredate and cause property damage, you want some kind of solution. You want them to stop depredating. But it's important to realize that this animal, which has a lifespan on average of five years, it's never known a world where there weren't cows and sheep. And they recognize cows and sheep as a viable food source. So after the great slaughter of our herbivores, it really wasn't until the 1900s, 1915 to 1931, that the Bureau of Biological Survey initiated a project to eradicate predators across the landscape. Right? And wolves and mountain lions, also known as cougars and pumas, they've got a lot of names, and grizzly bears and black bears were the primary targets. Now you had a lot of lesser or smaller predators as well that were targeted, eagles, hawks, skunks, raccoons, etc. But it was these large predators that were most easily targeted. And local governments worked really hard to eradicate these carnivores. Grizzly bears used to live in Oregon. They were eradicated. Uh, the last wolf eradicated in Oregon, I think it was in 1946, was the last time a bounty was paid on a wolf. So not even 100 years ago, you know, not even 80 years ago. Um, but we worked really hard to eradicate all of these species. And because this is a wolf talk, I'm just going to stick to the wolf stuff. Um, but wolves had a tremendous distribution across North America, as we've well established. They lived just about everywhere, from the Pacific to the Atlantic, from central Mexico all the way up through northern Alaska, um, but we very quickly eradicated them. Again, this is something that is not new. People have been eradicating wolves for a long time. We'd eradicated them from the British Isles just a few centuries before. We eradicated them from Japan, from many areas in, in Europe and Asia. Why this story is unique is because of the tools we used. So rather than just trapping and hunting wolves, we began to implement poison. And poison was ultimately the nail in the coffin that eradicated wolves and other predators very quickly. It was uh, usually strychnine and another compound known as 1080. And by lacing meat, it's just really easy to, to kill your carnivores that you're targeting, but also a bunch of non-target carnivores as well. So we went from having wolves just about everywhere to having successfully eradicated wolves throughout all of the contiguous United States with the exception of a very small population on the Minnesota-Canada border, up in what is now Voyagers National Park. So we never completely eradicated wolves from up there in the Great Lakes area, but everywhere else they were successfully eradicated. Um, this map, I'll kind of talk about this a little bit later, but um, gray wolves never really inhabited that southeastern portion of the US. And that is because that is the historical range of the red wolf, or Canis rufus, which is not very closely related to the wolf. It's more closely related to the coyote. Um, but we can talk more about that later. Now, I think what is fascinating is that public sentiment dictated that wolves and other carnivores be eradicated. But it was also public sentiment which reversed that. And it was several decades after we had torn up the wild, this wilderness that kind of makes the American independent spirit thrive, that people began to complain that humans were disrupting what made America great. We were disrupting the environment. We were disrupting wilderness. And so a bipartisan act was passed in the 1970s, 1973, 
the Endangered Species Act was created. And wolves were listed as being regionally extinct in the lower 48 states in 1974, so a year after the Endangered Species Act was passed. Now, it's important to realize that wolves were never in danger of going extinct globally, which is one of the reasons why the controversy over wolves has been so long lasting. Wolf populations, although persecuted in Alaska and Canada and in Siberia, um, have always been robust. So there's never been a threat of wolves going completely extinct. But regionally, they have lost a lot of their historical distribution. And we wanted to bring wolves back into the lower 48 states, a part of their historical distribution. So I'm really glazing over this because it's extremely complicated, but interesting. After making the list in 1974, we began to work collectively to bring wolves back. And we had to decide where wolves were going to come back. Now, I showed you that map. We decided to bring wolves back into the northern Rocky Mountains, which is technically Wyoming, Montana, and Idaho. Why did we pick the northern Rocky Mountains, do you think? Why didn't we pick, like, Kansas? Why didn't we pick New York? Why didn't we pick California? Because wolves historically were there. Why the northern Rocky Mountains? I heard both answers, and they're correct. Yeah, you've got low density of people, few people on the landscape. I mean, today even, Wyoming has a half a million people in the whole state. Uh, but of course, things are changing very quickly. And you also have food. Wolves don't eat corn, right? They need to eat elk. And you had wiped out your elk herds outside of everywhere except for the northern Rocky Mountains. So we picked the northern Rocky Mountains as the place we would reintroduce them. Those were the two defining criteria in the 1987 wolf recovery plan that we created. And the US Fish and Wildlife Service, along with state partners and along with national park partners, worked hard to bring wolves back. I'm going to put this on pause for just a second. And in the footnotes of our conversation, let's remember that just a generation prior, people had been eradicating wolves. And not everyone wanted wolves back. And even if they did want wolves back, a lot of people didn't want it to be in their backyard, right? And so local groups, local politics in these Rocky Mountain states were very concerned about wolf reintroduction, especially since these communities are rural and they are the ones that are most likely practicing ranching. So they're most likely to have negative effects of reintroduction, right? So you had a really strong social pushback locally because you can't tell me my granddad was wrong for killing the wolves. I don't want wolves back. Put them in someone else's state. <laughs> well, again, bipartisan collaboration in the 1990s finally came together and people decided that they would bring wolves back. So after 30 years of back and forth, a total of 66 wolves were live captured in Canada, first in Alberta in 1995, 1994, 1995, and then in British Columbia the next year in order to ensure genetic integrity of the populations. And 35 wolves were released into central Idaho, and 31 wolves were released into Yellowstone National Park. Now, the public at large very often just thinks of the Yellowstone reintroduction. But it's important for us to realize that wolves were not just released into Yellowstone. We picked three areas to reintroduce wolves. We picked Yellowstone because it's 2.2 million acres of a national park. We picked Central Idaho because of the Frank Church River of No Return Wilderness, which is the largest wilderness area in the lower 48 states. And we also picked northwestern Montana, Glacier National Park, the Northern Continental Divide area, to reintroduce wolves. And I'll get to your question in one second. Conveniently, in the 1980s, much to the thrill of taxpayers and policymakers, wolves tiptoed across the Canadian-Montana line on their own and started establishing themselves in northwestern Montana, which is why we didn't 
put wolves in northwestern Montana. They started to recover on their own. Yeah. Boy, I'm glad I was here. <laughs> so wolves started to come into northwestern Montana, but two years, 66 wolves, that's all it took, 66 wolves, bringing them down from Canada into Yellowstone and into central Idaho. About 400 miles is from where their capture site was, which is, as we know, from having an appreciation of wolf distribution, spatial distribution, we know is not a big deal. It's not a big deal for a wolf to walk 500 miles or 1,000 miles in less than a year. It's all the same species, okay? So this is a picture of my supervisor, um, Doug Smith, literally carrying wolves into Yellowstone. Um, and really, the rest is history. Wolves are tremendously fecund. They are very prolific, which is, I would argue, the greatest advantage to having reintroduced wolves. Success has not really been something we can attribute to ourselves. We brought wolves back, but wolves are very controversial, and there's been a lot of push and pull and poaching, etc. But what has made the reintroduction successful is the biology of the species. Giving enough resources in the right habitat, wolves can increase their population by a mean rate of 20% a year, which is like rabbits, okay? <laughs> wolves, because again, they're a cooperative breeding species, they work together to raise their young. This is another, this is interesting too, I'll take a side note. People often think that wolf packs are needed to hunt their prey, which makes sense, right? If you're an animal that is terrible at hunting, you don't have supinating wrists, retractable claws. You're not an ambush predator. You have a long nose, which means that your bite leverage is a lot less than a cat. You have to chase things down, many times larger than you, and catch it with your teeth and hope you don't get your head stove in by a hoof. Wolves are not good hunters. And yet, despite of all that, wolves can successfully bring down even the largest prey by themselves. Wolves, a wolf can kill a buffalo. A wolf can kill a moose. Wolf pack rates of success in predation do not increase the larger the pack size. We've studied this for a long time. My advisor, Dan McNulty, studied this in Yellowstone. Wolf kill success on prey does not increase above four wolves in the pack. That's all you need. If you have a pack of about 10, those other wolves are loafing. <laughs> they're just gonna, they're gonna mooch off of all the hard work. It's really four wolves that are doing most of the work, okay? So why do wolves live in social units that we call packs? It's to help raise offspring. It's to increase survival rates. And again, that alloparental care where others are participating in rearing offspring, that really unique, it's, it really is unique, um, ability for the male, for the father, to contribute to the food of his offspring when they're young, I mean, females create milk, therefore, in most mammalian species, it's just the male that hangs around to take care of her young, and the male splits, right? But males can go out and they can hunt, and then they can eat and then regurgitate food for the pups and for the female. And that's, that's a pretty unique role that the male wolf uh, has in the fact that he can help rear his offspring. So all that goes back to the fact that wolf populations increase. 66 wolves we reintroduced. And within just a few years, by 2006, we had already reached the basement objective for delisting wolves in Idaho, Montana, and Wyoming. We had already reached a population that exceeded our basement objectives. We could delist them. They were no longer imperiled. Well, not everyone agreed. And so Back and forth in courts for many years, we had wolves going to and fro, to and fro. Should we protect them more? Should we let the population get larger? Should we not? Finally, in 2011, wolves were congressionally, in a congressional rider, they were delisted in Montana and in Idaho. And then in 2017, they were delisted in Wyoming. The wolf population has since grown, and they've expanded throughout all of the northern Rocky Mountain states in areas where the habitat is suitable. We also have had this really incredible opportunity to research and study wolves in a way that we had never been able to do before. We reintroduced wolves 
according to the mandate of the Endangered Species Act because it was our moral obligation to do that. Not because we had any understanding of what wolves as an apex predator would mean for the ecosystem or the environment. That was all a lovely side effect that we found out about later on. So we've done a really intensive job of monitoring wolves. This is, again, Doug. This picture was taken by a friend. As, uh, we're darting wolves and collaring wolves. This is uh, one of the wolves that we later collared. But all of this has given us a better understanding of three very important things. One, the range of wolves, how far they can disperse. By putting radio collars on wolves, we learn what habitat they use. We also learn how far they move. We've had wolves from Yellowstone go all the way down to the Grand Canyon and turn around and head back. Um, we also have had a better understanding of how they hunt, you know, what they're capable of doing. And we also have had a much better understanding of their social dynamics. Again, alpha, this alpha hierarchy that we used to associate with wolves is a myth. Um, instead, it's more of a family unit. And it's not a simple family unit very often. Very frequently, it's, it's complicated. Um, then we started having wolves as early as 1999. Wolves, of course, coming out of Idaho as the population grew and making its way here into Oregon, where we're at today. And this is our area of known wolf activity as of this last December. Um, we have uh, fewer wolves here in central Oregon as they're coming from the northeast. Uh, we can expect more of them to set up shop here. We have uh, a breeding pair, we're assuming is a breeding pair, um, just outside of Sisters and Lower Bridge up in the National Grasslands area. We have a pack just to the south of us, the Upper Deschutes pack. Um, those are kind of the two closest packs that are uh, nearest here to Bend. But again, wolves grow up and they disperse and they leave their homes. And it's uh, then important for us to look for other areas where they're beginning to, to come into the state and set up shop. So all of this is where kind of we as biologists come in. We're responsible for monitoring and, and making sure that the population is doing well. Now, I'm going to wrap up here in the next minute or two. Uh, our wolf population in Oregon is currently estimated. It's, I shouldn't say that. We conducted a census where we observed wolves last year and counted 178 wolves in the state. So that's the census. That is the minimum number of wolves that we have in Oregon as of last December, right? Last February, actually, is when we concluded that. So 178 wolves is the minimum. That was before we whelped. That was before we had pups. But wolves grow up. They get killed. They die. You know, stuff. Life happens. Um, we know that we have more wolves than that on the landscape, but we're being cautious. And we expect more wolves to come into the into the uh, population as the population grows. But with wolves we have to take into consideration two very important things. One, ecological predictors, and we've already talked about how adaptive wolves are. They can eat elk, but if they can't get, get elk then they can eat geese or cows or sheep or dogs or cats. In places of the world, like in India and in parts of Europe, there are wolves in Rome, Italy. There's a thriving population of wolves in the city. And they live like coyotes. They eat garbage. Um, we have to ask ourselves, you know, where is our social tolerance? Where are we going to allow this highly adaptive animal to live? And that's where our social predictors come into play. So we've got human land use, which is one of our biggest concerns. Um, we reintroduced wolves into the northern Rocky Mountains back in the 90s because there were few people there. That's changed. More and more people are moving into those rural areas which shrinks this invisible social carrying capacity boundary line that we put around large carnivores. And as wolves move into Bend area, in case you haven't noticed, it's a city, right? And it's difficult for us to draw lines of where wolves can and can't be. I like bears. I really like grizzly bears. I grew up in grizzly bear country, just two miles outside of Yellowstone National Park. I don't want grizzly bears on my kid's playground at the public park. That's my social tolerance, right? Like, I don't want grizzly bears in my backyard. In my garden, it's not OK. And I'm a biologist who loves large carnivores. And we have to ask ourselves, as we expand our human footprint, 
these urban questions, I think, are more dramatic and need to be addressed than the livestock issues, which is the other human, um, human social predictor in terms of wolf spatial distribution, right? We have cows and we have sheep on the landscape. We have to take that into consideration, which we do as biologists. We're very often dealing with producers that have depredation problems. But we're very much focusing the attention on livestock when we need to start thinking about what happens if we get wolves on the west side of the Cascades. There's not a lot of area that they can be socially tolerated. Wolves will be fine living off of our garbage piles. They're that adaptive. But is that what we want? I don't think so. So these are questions to ask ourselves. Um, again, wolves being highly dynamic, the more people we have on the landscape, uh, the bigger our footprint is. Uh, I almost was, was not going to stick this in here, but now I've really put my foot in my mouth. Um, wolf hunting is very controversial, right? Um, and I'm not going to argue that it's not controversial, because it is. Um, wolves are a very charismatic species, and they are interesting to a lot of people. But again, it's important for us to realize that wolves are very prolific. And one of the reasons why wolf hunting, which doesn't take place in Oregon, but it does take place in Wyoming, Idaho, and Montana, where they're delisted, um, why it is so aggressively pursued. This is a graph I put together of the Northern Rocky Mountain wolf population based off of numbers available to the public. It's not super scientific, so don't like hold this to doctrine. But when we first reintroduced wolves, the wolf population began to increase very quickly. And in 2011 and then in 2017, we initiated rather aggressive hunting and trapping seasons in Montana, Idaho, and Wyoming, where as much as 30% of the population is harvested every year. Despite that number, the population is still growing. Again, it's not really about us and toting our success for reintroducing this species and having it recover. It's a lot to do with the biology. Studies show that wolf populations can sustain 35% of a reduction every year for several years before any negative effects take place to the population at large. Right. Um, so despite there being hunting and trapping, the populations are stable or growing. And now you can kind of understand why people who don't like wolves are frustrated at hunting and trapping not working. And they want to liberalize more hunting and trapping efforts to try and keep that wolf population down. Does that make sense? So again, biologically speaking, wolves are pretty much bulletproof. They're just not poison proof. Yeah. Yeah, so this is getting more into like the ethics of wolf hunting, right? So from, from a numbers perspective, the population is going to be fine. But from uh, the social dynamic perspective of a local unit, a pack, how does pack, or how does wolf hunting disrupt pack dynamics? That's a bigger question. Most wolves that are killed are usually pups or young wolves. Most wolves that die in the wild are pups or young wolves, right? It's, it's compensatory predation by humans on wolves. But if you do kill a male or female breeder, that really disrupts yeah, the pack dynamics at large. I trap wolves to, to radio collar them, so I live trap wolves. It's really hard to get a breeder. The breeders, the adults, they've been around and they're smart. And they're usually the hardest ones to hunt or to trap. But absolutely, that's a really difficult ethical question that has to be considered. Right? And well, when the alpha gets killed, then another one step up? It does, but it can disband the pack. So if you have an alpha female, I just used alpha, if you have a breeding female that gets killed, then the male might split and he might take off. Because inbreeding is usually avoided. So if the male is left just with his direct offspring, he's not going to breed with one of his daughters. Does that make sense? He'll leave. Vice versa, too. If the male gets killed, the female's going to split. 
This is where things get complicated if you have adoptees. If you've got a stepson or a stepdaughter, then yeah, the female will, like an unrelated female will step up and will breed with the male. And we usually see what's called matrilineal pack fidelity. So males and females both disperse from packs when they come of age. But usually females tend to stick around a little bit more than the males because if mom dies or if another male is adopted into the pack, she's going to have a chance of reproducing with a non-related individual. Does that make sense? So it's complicated to say the least, right? Just a human family dynamic can't be oversimplified and say it's, it's always nuclear. And a wolf pack can't always be oversimplified and say it's, it's nuclear. It really has to do with the demography of the landscape around it and how many wolves you have. Yeah? Oh boy. Well, good question. So I'll take the broader step back and say that in predation, in ecology, things are not as simplistic as Disney wants us to believe, right? There's not this balance of nature where carnivores live in perfect harmony with prey. You have what's usually called a lag cycle, right? So it takes a while for the, pre the prey population, if it decreases due to disease or something, it takes a while for the predator population to also go down. So if you have what's called additive predation, and I don't want to overwhelm you with too many technical terms, if you have more predators on the landscape than prey, you're going to have a negative effect on your prey population. In some cases, and they are not many, in some cases, like in northern Idaho, you have what's called a predator pit, where you have a lot of bears, a lot of wolves, and a lot of lions, and you have a struggling elk population. And that elk population can't be released. You don't get enough recruitment because there are so many predators on the landscape. And in some cases, it's important to realize that not all predators have teeth, at least big teeth. Sometimes the predator is disease, right? We also have additive predation on our Sierra bighorn sheep populations where they are very susceptible to pneumonia and then you've got a robust population of mountain lions. And so the disease, the pneumonia, and the mountain lions are suppressing that bighorn sheep population. And when that happens, yeah, it's, you can have a predator population wipe out a prey population. Now that doesn't happen often. Usually it's what we call compensatory predation where the predators are eating the weak the easiest ones to catch, the sick, the old, the young. Um, that's all to say that in some areas, there are designated predator zones in order to help prey populations rebound because they're right now being suppressed by predators. Again, there's not a lot of them, but it happens. Um, more often than not, people hunt wolves either for a trophy or the pelts, trapping especially. Wolf pelts make a lot of money. Um, you can sell a wolf pelt for $1,000. Um, yeah, so it's for people who do it regularly, who are like actual wolf hunters, it's for the pelts. People who do it opportunistically, it's usually for the trophy. Does that make sense? Yeah. They're dangerous, just like all wild animals are dangerous. Um, I don't know if you guys heard about the beaver who killed someone just a couple years ago. No, a lady in the Colorado Springs area went to feed her neighbor's dog. <coughs> they were on vacation, and they were the dogs were fenced in. <coughs> but some kind of an animal <coughs> attacked her and killed her because they were in the snow. They were tracked. Well, I'm going to say wolf tracks. Her nine-year-old son was in the pickup and saw it. Mm. That's been 15, 20 years ago, maybe. So wolves are dangerous, and they do occasionally kill people. In parts of the world, like India, um, children, again, I already talked about this, children are frequently, not a lot of the time, but frequently documented as having been killed by wolves. And again, it's usually the habitat and the lack of adult supervision. You also have areas of the world where rabies is not um, 
prevented, measures are not taken to prevent rabies in populations like we do here. In the last 100 years in North America, we've documented two confirmed uh, mortalities by wolves on people. So yeah, it happens. All wild animals are dangerous. And I wasn't just joking about the beaver killing someone. Um, also up in Washington, I think this was maybe eight or nine years ago, I don't know if you heard about the mountain goat that killed a hiker. Um, Gordon, you know, those mountain goats are pretty docile. Uh, but yeah, all wild animals are dangerous, just like feral dogs are dangerous, or non-feral dogs are dangerous too. I think that that's really important for us to realize is, yeah, wildlife is dangerous. And we have to ask ourselves, again, with that social caring capacity, what level of risk are we willing to tolerate? I come from grizzly bear country. Mountain biking and trail running are two really big and growing sports taking place in Yellowstone's area. That's ridiculous, in my opinion. I love to mountain bike and I love to run, but I don't do it in grizzly bear habitat, right? <laughs> and if you do it, you have to be willing to accept the risks that you could surprise a grizzly bear and get killed. Um, you're playing in grizzly bear country. And as wolves come into Oregon, we have to ask ourselves, what are we willing to change about our behavior and the way we recreate? Yeah. Wolves, that's a very good point. Wolves do not typically make meals of people. They avoid people. They've been persecuted long enough that they know to avoid people. And we want to make sure that they continue to avoid people. I don't know if you're aware of the incident in the Indigo Pack down kind of by Crescent Lake um, where a wolf was being habituated. Maybe people were putting out food and feeding the wolves, right? That's happened in Yellowstone at least twice, where we've uh, had to kill wolves. We've had to euthanize wolves because they were habituated to people giving them food. And I am going to wrap up just about now, but I will say that livestock is another issue. I don't think it's really relevant to this audience. But there are a lot of tools out there where we work to try and create social tolerance for people raising livestock with wolves. Wolves generally don't kill a lot of livestock, but if it happens to you, it hurts. And it's very challenging. And especially if you don't like wolves to begin with, it makes you ornery. Fortunately, I've had nothing but positive interactions with ranchers and cowboys. Um, people generally just are trying to make a living and they want to be heard. And I think that the hysteria about wolves and livestock is often overplayed because we have ways to to figure things out and have coexistence. This is to conclude with kind of the, the population estimates that we have today. I didn't talk about the Great Lakes states, but the Great Lakes states have had their wolf population recover. It's larger than ours here in the Northern Rocky Mountains and Pacific Northwest. In 1998, we reintroduced uh, Canis lupus bailei, the Mexican wolf, to Arizona and New Mexico. The population's down there. You're probably familiar with uh, transitory populations in Northern California and uh, Colorado is planning on reintroducing wolves this year. And then the red wolf has been a different effort. Um, again, a completely different species out there. And in Alaska and in Canada, wolf populations are still very robust. Um, I'll conclude with this quote from my hero, Aldo Leopold, the father of wildlife management, who said that only the mountain has lived long enough to listen objectively to the howl of a wolf. I think that's true. Um, I started out by explaining that humans are a storytelling species. I'm a biologist, and I told you that my goal today was to present facts. And I want you to walk away with a better and healthier understanding of what really a wolf is. But at the end of the day, I still have my own story. And I think wolves are fascinating. And they are charismatic. And they excite me. And because of that, I'm a wolf biologist, and I think that's probably the same reason why you're here listening today. So thank you very much. I appreciate it.